Okay, so having covered the general hardware setup of Archer in the previous uh, couple of lectures, the short one and the longer one, we're now going to talk more about the software, but in particular how you actually compile and run jobs on, on Archer, because this um, may be different from uh, systems you've used in the past. As again, this material is under our standard uh, Creative Commons non-commercial license. So first of all, software on Archer is controlled uh, via a system called modules, which is a, a package provided by, by GNU. And the main um, feature of modules is that it, you can manage a lot of different software packages, but you don't have to worry about explicitly setting paths for um, executables or, or to libraries or include files. What you do is you just you know type the command you want, but the, whatever module is loaded controls exactly which version is executed. And um, this is very, very useful uh, because it makes managing large software packages much simpler. And so um, Whenever you go into a log login session, you get your own module state, and um, you may um, type a command. For example, we'll see that the compilers are actually um, wrapped up with compiler wrappers, but what is actually executed depends on what module is loaded. Now, there's a standard set of default modules loaded when you first log in, which are useful for, which are, which are relevant for most you know, most purposes. But you may want to change them uh, later on. If you want to look at the current state, you type module list. So, for example, here's an example. Um, from a colleague of mine, Adrian's done module list, and you can see there's a whole bunch of stuff there. Um, and basically, what it's showing you is, is software packages. For example, um, Cray PE is the Cray programming environment. And then after the slash, there's a version number. So if you want to view what uh, modules are available, I mean, there's hundreds of, of, of modules available, um, you can just type module avail. Now, that will give you an awful lot of stuff. So if you want to narrow down, you can just uh, type a first couple of letters. So if you wanted to know which um, versions were available from the GNU compiler collection, you do module avail GC, and, and then it will show you everything that's available that begins with GC. And you can see at this point in time, we had a lot of, of compilers um, uh, loaded a lot of versions of GCC, but the default one you'll see there is 4.8.1. So that means if you type GCC, you will get 4.8.1. If you want to get a different version of GCC, you don't type a different command, you still type GCC, but you don't load a different module. And so um, you can see. If you want to load a module, which might not be loaded by default, you do module load, and there's a, um, a package called performance tools, which allows you to do various performance analysis. Uh, you could load a different version. You do module load perf tools slash 6.1.0, and that would mean that all the commands for the performance tools would be exactly the same, but you'd be running a different version. Or you can swap out. You might want to swap out the Intel, to, uh, swap a compiler for something else. You might have the default Intel um, package loaded. You want to module swap Intel for a particular compiler version or unload something, module unload perf tools. Now, what these modules do is actually under the hood, they go away and they change all these um, environment variables, which you'll normally have to edit by hand, like path, man path, license file, load library path, all this kind of stuff. But on the Cray, on Archer, you should really use the modules. You should not be embedding specific explicit paths or or, 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 um, or library load paths into your make files or your compilation scripts. You should just use um, the basic commands but alter what they do by loading the uh, appropriate module. And so, for example, if you really want to know what's going on, you can look at a particular package with module show. So Adrian's done module show FFTW, which is a package for Fourier transforms, the fastest Fourier transform in the West. And it shows that currently the version is 3.3.0.4. And this shows you all the stuff which is set. There's lots of uh, um, things to do with architectures and paths and such like. But hopefully you shouldn't need to know that information. You should be able to get away with just typing FFTW or, or linking to the FFTW package and you'll pick up the, the most current version. And the reason that modules are so useful is it means that um, systems people can upgrade compilers so most people will then get the new compiler because it's rolled over to a newer version they, and so if they don't change their scripts they'll get the new compiler. But if they want to, to check um, if things have changed, they want to explicitly get an older version of the compiler, they can load in a different module. Or, for example, when a new compiler is um, released, it may be made available, but not made the default. So you can change the new compiler in advance and debug things like that.
So modules are very useful, just a list of, of the commands, what's available, module avail or module avail CCE would tell you what all the modules that you could load uh, beginning with the letter CCE module list tells you what's loaded at the moment. You can load specific modules with module load. You might want to change and so a classic thing we'll see later on is you want, might change compilers you're using and that's done with the module swap. And so you might want to swap between the programming environment for the Cray compilers to the programming environment for the GNU compilers. Or you might swap particular versions. You may have the Cray compiler environment 8.0.2 and you want to have the 7.4.4 to look at a, get a previous version of the compiler. Unloading with module unload. Module help gives you release notes. And module show shows you the actually, actually what's being set when, when you load that module. So, apologies, I've, I've gone rather fast forward. Um, okay, back to where we started. So how do you actually compile applications for, for the Cray? Well, this is going to be slightly unusual probably to you, but the compilers on the Cray are always called the same thing. The C compiler is always called lowercase cc, the C++ compiler is always called uppercase cc, and the Fortran compiler is always called ftn. And these are actually uh, drivers that they're, they're wrapper scripts. But what um, compiler is actually executed depends on which module you have loaded. Now, we'll, so for example, if you wanted to compile um, a Fortran program, you'd always type ftn minus c prog 1.f90. However, which compilers you actually call as de determined by the programming environment module. This programming environment module is, is actually a whole bunch of stuff loaded together, but you, you load it, it's kind of a meta module, you load it once. So the default uh, programming environment is called progenv cray and that means when you type um, ftn cc or, or capital cc you will actually get the cray versions of the compiler which are called cray ftn cray cc and cray, cray cc if you swapped to the intel compiler progenv intel you would then get i fort icc and the intel c++ icpc again you would still say ftn cc or capital cc but it would call those and similarly if you switch the the GNU compiler can collect collection by swapping in prog and GNU, you'd get G4 and GCC and G++. And as we've seen before, you use module swap. So when you log in, the default will be the Cray programming environment. You might want to use the Intel compilers. You do module swap prog and Cray, prog and Intel. If you want to do this every time you log in, you could put this in your, your bash script, your, your bash profile script. Module list is always a nice way of... Now, actually, progenv Cray is loaded by default on Archer. On other Cray systems, it may be different, so module list is useful. Um, there are... A lot of stuff is loaded by bus default, so not only are these compilers wrappers which call um, specific compilers, they also include all the common flags. So on the Cray, we assume you've got an MPI program, so you don't have to do minus L MPI or any include paths. The Cray MPI module, Cray MPitch, is loaded by default. And there are some which you wanted to use um, Shemem, which is the open Shemem interface. You do module load Cray Shemem, but Cray MPI CH is loaded by default. So not only do you always use the same compiler, same um, syntax, same uh, um, command to invoke the compiler, uh, the first thing you do when you port to the Cray is you probably go to the make file and simplify. You don't need all these minus L, MPI, minus I, all stuff. Uh, so we've seen the, the, the drivers automatically support an MPI build. Um, we have to note, though, you remember from right back at the start, or the, in pro the previous lecture, we said that the, the service nodes, the login nodes that you log into, have a different version of Linux from the, um, the back-end nodes. The login nodes have full Linux, and the back-end nodes have a stripped-down CLE um, um, Linux. Now, again, all these... Um, the, the wrappers assume that you're compiling for the, uh, the the compute nodes, the back-end nodes, so you just run them. However, if you called the the actual compilers directly with all the, without all the magic flags that the wrappers are giving for you, if you called Cray FDN or ICC or G++ directly, this would give you Linux executable for the login node, and that isn't guaranteed to run on the more stripped-down um, uh, compute nodes. So you should always use FTN, CC, or CC. Uh, the only time you use the direct compiler commands if you really, is if you really want the executable to run on the login nodes. It might be a little utility program or a setup or something like that. So these are the compiler versions. Um, 
as I said, if you load, load the programming environment, the Cray programming environment, you get a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, but one of the things you get is CCE, the Cray compiler environment, which is the, which is the module, uh, which is the module for that compiler. Um, Progen Intel loads the Intel compiler module, and Progen GNU loads the GCC compiler module. Uh, normally, the most recent version will be the default, but you might want to, if you start seeing a bug in your code and you see there's been a compiler upgrade, it's the first thing you should probably do is swap to the previous version of the compiler and, and then you can verify if, it, if it's a problem with your code or some issue that's been caused by the compilers. The reason that we have PGI grayed out here is that on Hector, the previous um, machine to Archer, we didn't have the Intel a compiler suite, we actually had the, the, the Portland Group PGI compiler suite. PGI is no longer supported, um, so the three compiler suites are Cray, Intel and GNU, and not Cray, GNU and PGI as they were on Hector. So if you're porting a code from Hector, then you may have to change um, some, of your, uh, some of your commands. Again, if you say here, the typical thing you do in a make file when you have a build script is have lots of minus i, minus l, and minus l flags to say where the include files should be should be found, where the uh, the libraries are stored, and which ones to link in. Um, these are not needed, so typically you should get rid of them and control that external to the make file by loading the appropriate module. Some make files absolutely insist that you specify something for minus l, so just specify minus l dot just to sort of fool the compiler. If you really, really need a specific part then you should do module show for the particular module show x module show ffdw and you'll see those environment variables but the danger about hard coding them into your make files and such like is that these won't be updated automatically when the software is updated so you'll have to have to make sure that you can get some incompatibilities there so you, you should really try and avoid specifying hard coding um, the paths so again we've seen this before if you wanted to find out what was actually being specified with with the ffdw um, library, the module, you do module show FFTW and you get the gory detail of where the um, uh, various things are. Um, so the two most common parallel programming paradigms are uh, MPI, message passing for, for internode um, communications, but you can in, inside a node, inside a single Linux shared memory uh, machine you can use OpenMP and OpenMP is supported by all the programming environments um, so the Cray, Intel, and GNU compilers all support OpenMP, but um, you have to be careful. There's a slightly different default behavior. So if you're using the Cray programming environment, then OpenMP is, is enabled by default. And if you want to disable it, you'll have to do minus H no OMP. Um, on the Intel and GNU compiler uh, modules, then OpenMP is disabled by default, which is maybe what the normal um, situation and you have to enable it with minus open MP or minus F open MP um, if you do want to find man pages if you do man CC you will get the manual page for the CC compiler wrapper man FTM will get you the manual page for the Fortran compiler wrapper if you really want to see actual um, the details of the compiler you'll have to type the specific um, actual compiler name. So for example, if you want to get the details for the, the Cray Fortran compiler, you'd have to do man Cray FTN. Or if you wanted to get the the details for the, the Intel C++ compiler, you do man ICPC. If you if you get confused and you don't know which one you're running, you can do um, you can run the compiler with minus V or minus minus version and you, it, that will spit out um, exactly what's being run. And there's there's some reference manuals there. The only other thing which might be slightly unusual is um, the default behavior is to do static linking. Um, this is maybe not normal. On normal shared systems, you use dynamic linking where the libraries are only actually loaded at runtime. But on, on the Cray, it's, it's, it's much more standard and simpler to do static linking where the, the libraries are actually uh, all, all packaged up at the link stage. This means your executables tend to be much larger, but it, it does make things simpler. Uh, there are ways of um, of getting around this, but dynamic linking is slightly difficult on the Cray, so you'll need to look at the um, look at the man pages. Uh, also, you'll have to make sure and be clear that you'll have to make any dynamic avail libraries available on the slash work file system. As we saw, you compile on the login nodes and you can see slash home and slash work there, but when you run a job, um, it runs on the compute nodes, which can't see slash home. 
So that's not a problem with the static executable because um, all the libraries will be will be exported with the executable. But with dynamic uh, linking, you have to make sure that the the library itself is available at runtime, which means it needs to be on slash work. Uh, there's information on the man pages if you want to do that. As we've seen here, OpenMP is on by default. It's um, w with the Cray compiler environment, um, and there are various. Um, examples there on how to shut it off and turn it on there's various ways of of, of, of controlling it um, auto threading is not on by default there's, there's a cray um, way of, of doing automatic threading so it's best to turn that it's not on because the, the OpenMP is a lot more of an explicit interface so the idea is you're, you, there's no automatic threading everything's explicit um, you, the main thing is if you have OpenMP directives in your code you have to make sure that OpenMP is shut off at compile time. Now that will be the default for the GNU and Intel compilers, but with the Cray compilers, you'll have to do minus H no OMP. Again, the main thing I'm saying here is that the compilers are different. They take different flags and different approaches, and um, the the GNU compiler tends to be not very um, aggressive in terms of optimization. So if you're using the GNU compiler, you'll probably have to up the optimization level. The Intel compiler is a bit more aggressive. Um, uh, the Cray compiler is much more aggressive. I mean, typically, if you just compile a code with the default options, it will go faster with the Cray compiler. But that may just be because the Cray compiler option default compiler options on the Cray are set higher. So if you're using Intel or GNU, you need to check that you're, you're, you're upping the compiler level, the optimization level to the correct, the correct level. In practice, it's typically um, compiled with the GNU compiler suite, GCC. You, if you're used to using GNU, you will have to specify higher than the default optimization levels to get reasonable performance. <coughs> Excuse me. And there's a big table here of, of what you need to do. The, the way where modules, um, the idea of modules is that they're transparent. So you type CC and you get whatever Cray compiler, sorry, whatever C compiler is loaded at that point. Of course, the target compilers, the Cray, GNU and Intel compilers actually take different options. So your make file has to still have um, different options for, for different compilers. And here's a here's a list of the kind of common things you might want to do. I don't want to go through them all, but for example, if you want to promote your reels to be to be um, 64 bit double precision on the Cray it's minus S real 64 on, on the Intel it's minus real size 64 on the GNU it's uh, minus F real for real eight. So, so, so there's a good, there's common things you might want to do um, are all possible with the different compilers, but you have to specify an option which is specific to the model you have loaded at that particular time. So having compiled the job, you have to actually run it. And as we've seen, you never log on to the compute nodes. You submit your job to be run on the compute nodes and you submit via the PBS batch system, portable batch system, the standard batch system. So, you have to create a script, you create a little a PBS job script, and um, you request resources from PBS. And so in your script, you can actually request them by using hash PBS, which is formerly a comment comment in a, in a, in a bash script, but PBS will, will pass that. So if you wanted to run for 12 hours of wall time, you could put hash PBS minus L wall time equals 12 hours in the script, or you can override them at the submission time, Q sub minus L wall time equals something uh, will override that. And the common options are naming the job minus N, which queue you want to submit to, I'll cover that later, where you want the output and error files to go to. I like minus J because it combines out, um, standard out and standard error into a single stream. Wall time is, is the occupancy time, and, and minus A will come back to you later, but, but tells you what, what account to run the job under. On, on Archer, um, except for one exception, all, all jobs are, are charged. You have a budget of time, and you need to say, I want to charge this job to this particular budget of time, and that's the minus A flag. So this is quite important on Archer. When you request, request parallel resources, you request them in numbers of nodes. You don't request processors, you request nodes. So you need to remember there are 24 cores, 24 processor cores per node. And the reason that's a sensible thing to do on Archer is that we allocate, the minimum quantum of allocation is a node. You get exclusive access to a node, so it wouldn't make sense to request 36 cores. We'd have to round that up to two nodes. So so, so it's much more sensible to ask for nodes. So select equals num nodes. Minus L select equals num nodes. Request the number of nodes, and that's so as you see at the bottom. Q sub minus L select equals num nodes. My job. 
you might run on one, ten, 100 nodes. The only other select option you're likely to use is if you want to request high memory. As we saw, a subset, uh, one group of Archer, has um, 128 gigabytes per node, not 64. And then you do minus L select equals num nodes and colon big mem equals true. Um, so that's a way to... If you don't select big mem equals true, then your job may run on the low on the small memory node, the standard memory nodes, or the high memory nodes. But if you do big mem equals true, it's guaranteed to run on the high memory nodes, and you, you may require that. And there's up to, as we saw, there's up to two uh, cabinets worth, a whole group's worth of, of high memory nodes. Within your script, you have to launch your parallel application, which is fairly standard. Um, the two things that are slightly non-standard is that in Cray terminology, we talk about things called processing elements. Um, and in, uh, really, a processing element is just like a single process or core. In an MPI job, a processing element corresponds to a single MPI process. And um, on Archer, on Cray systems, we don't use a job launcher called MPI exec or MPI run. The job launcher is called app run, application run. And um, the most important parameter is minus n. So app run minus n24 myprog.exe, my MPI prog, will, will run on 24 um, cores. Also, it'll um, create 24 MPI processes and then run on 24 cores. There are a lot of um, other options to AP run. For example, minus capital N sense tells you how many processing elements to put per compute node. And this is the kind of thing you might want to play around with if you're mixing MPI and OpenMP, where... Although you have 24 cores on a node, you don't want to run 24 MPI processes. You might want to run 12 or 6 or fewer than 24 and use up the other cores using threading. So AP run minus N24 minus capital N12 uses tw two nodes because it, it, it spawns 24 MPI processes, but only puts 12 of them on a node, so that gives you two nodes. And, of course, your AP run command has to be compatible with what you selected at, at submit time. You have to have requested as much or more resources than you need, otherwise AP run will, com will complain and say there's not enough resources allocated. We've talked about the batch systems, about the file system, sorry. When you log in, say you were doing a guest, you were on the training course, you had a guest account in the Y14 project, you've been in hash slash home slash Y14 slash Y14 slash guest01. But as we said before, compute nodes can only see slash work. So the most standard thing to do is launch all parallel jobs from slash work. So whenever you log in, the first thing you do is cd to slash work slash y14 slash y14 slash guest01. And you might have be gearing up for a Nobel Prize. You go into a Nobel Prize jobs directory and you submit your Nobel Prize winning batch script. The most common mistake on Archer for new users is to compile in slash home and submit in slash home. What will happen is the job, your script will be submitted, but almost certainly at runtime, the job will fail because uh, the compute nodes won't be able to see slash home. So that's, that's a, if your job fails with mysterious error messages, the first thing to check is that you definitely submitted from slash home. Here's an example batch, batch script. Um, I'll go through it quickly, but it's minus n names the job. It's called the example MPI job. We're asking for 64 nodes, which is 64 times 24 cores, and we're running for 20 minutes. We have to specify a project code. We might be, well, we've seen the guest account will be Y14. You have to do PBS minus the account code. Um, the PBS, um, the standard thing to do is to... Um, uh, change directory. When when the script runs, you also start in slash home. So the first thing that scripts do, the sensible thing to do is cd to where you came from. So basically you want the script to, to change directory to where it was submitted from. And there's a variable called pbso work do, which is that, which is set to that. So this, the cl classic thing to do in a batch script is to cd dollar pbso work do, which says, uh, go back to the place where I came from. The previous line is just because there's some complication that there might be symbolic links in in, in, in where you are. And this just unwraps all the symbolic links. You, you, you only need that strange read link um, line if you're using symbolic links to cross-link various, um, various directories. Once we've done all that, we run AP run. We do AP run minus N1536, and 64 nodes is compatible with 1536. So 64 nodes times 24 MPI processes per node is 1536. And you run your executable. It's fairly standard for any batch system. Just a little bit about the PBS configuration. Unlike other systems, you don't normally submit to a specific queue. You just do QSub, and PBS internally decides how to schedule your job. 
it does assume you run for all the time requested on all the nodes. So, so you know, if you know your job's going to run for three hours, don't request 24 hours because it will get, you know, it, it won't get run until the system thinks there's 24 hours worth of, of, of processes available. Uh, maximum runtime is 24 hours in the standard queue, and the maximum job size is the entire machine. There are some limits. You can't have too many jobs queued or running. Um, we try and do as much checking as possible. So at submission time, if the budget code doesn't have enough time or you specify a budget you don't have access to, your job will be rejected at submission time. It is possible for jobs to queue indefinitely. If you see a job queuing indefinitely, something might have happened. For example, at submission time, the budget might have had enough time in it. Then you've run other jobs and, and that budget has gone very low or negative. So, you know, we can't. If, if a valid budget has sufficient resources when PBS attempts to run the job, which could be quite a long time after you submitted it, what happens if the job is queued? Which means that gives you a chance to up, to put more time back into that budget, in which case the job might run it again. But we do try and do as much checking as possible at submission time. There are some special queues. There's a low priority queue, limited to three hours and 512 nodes. And that is only active when the machine is lightly used, but users aren't charged. So this is a way for running relatively small jobs but 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 just soaking up unused time if you want a long job there's a, queue, a long queue q sub minus q long that can run for up to 48 hours twice the default maximum but on up to 256 nodes there's a very short debug queue which is enabled during working hours um, q sub minus q short and that's maximum 20 minutes and eight nodes and that's really most useful for debugging and and, um, and development work we do have some post-processing or, or the, or the or serial nodes, there's a couple of nodes with 40 cores in them, but a lot of memory. They're actually a different architecture from the compute nodes, and so they're not natively supported by the, the Cray programming environment. And they're much more general purpose. They're not tightly controlled as the compute nodes. That, you know, you share these with other people, but they're really there for two things. One is for really big compilation jobs, but most importantly, they're there for, for pre- and post-processing. And that's why they've been um, equipped with so much memory. So... Um, if, you're going to, if you want to compile jobs that are going to run on these serial nodes, you want to compile them with the native uh, compilers, GCC, G4, and ICC, or I4. You don't want to use the compiler wrappers, because as we said before, the compiler wrappers assume you're cross-compiling for the, the, the back-end compute nodes. And when you run, you do QSub, you do a standard QSub, you select equals serial equals true. That says I want to select the serial queue, and you do N CPUs equals one. You just say you want one CPU. Uh, these aren't controlled, so it doesn't really matter. Um, uh, you, once you're on, you can run, um, use as many cores as you want. So just a brief um, statement about project management. We've mentioned that all jobs have a budget a allocated to them, or all users, all groups have budgets allocated to them. How is that controlled? Well, everything on Archer is controlled via a very sophisticated web interface written by uh, various people, um, colleagues of mine at EPCC. It's called The Safe. And you will all have an account on that. Every, every user account, uh, every user has an account on the safe, and they can use that to manage multiple login accounts and multiple projects. It's a single point of contact for managing machine accounts and such like. It's really, if you're a principal investigator, you'll use it most often. Pr principal investigators of projects can use it to control projects, approve new accounts, and, and, and move time between projects and users. So, as you've mentioned, all jobs are charged to a budget. The standard budget is the project name, so on the training course you're in the Y14 budget, hash PBS minus A Y14. But you can create sub-budgets, and different projects are run different ways. It, it, within your project, the principal investigator may have decided to leave all the time in the default budget, or may have allocated it down to sub-budgets, which are allocated to users. That's dependent on how your principal investigator decides to run your project. Allocation is done in things called COWs, killer allocation units. One kilo allocation unit is a thousand gigaflop hours, where this performance is measured using the standard impact benchmark. Just to give you a ballpark of how much a cow is, a kilo AU, on Archer, a kilo AU costs 56 pence for episode NERC users, or um, a core hour is 0 0.015 kilo AUs, a node hour is about 0.36 cows. A kilo AU is about three node hours, that's maybe a nice uh, ballpark figure. But it is important to note your charge for a full node regardless of how many cores you run. So if you act, I mean, you have to be careful if you use the minus capital N parameter when you run jobs, it's possible to run fewer than 24 MPI processes per node. It's perfectly reasonable. You may want to do that, but you have to be clear. It's up to you to make sure you use these, those other cores. 
you are charged for, 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 for every node you use, regardless of whether you use any all the cores, because of course those cores are blocked from usage from other users, so we charge you for them. However, you're only charged for how long your job actually runs. So if you requested 24 hours and your job crashes after five minutes, or completes after five minutes, you're only charged for those five minutes. So um, what now? Well, you can attempt the Archer driving test. That was one of the, the, the points of this um, of this uh, talk or this set of talks. There's the, the URL, and uh, as it says, successful completion eligible users. That's users who are eligible, eligible to use Archer, which means basically people people in the UK um, can apply for an account on Archer, and you'll get about uh, 1,200 cows of time, which is quite a substantial time, 80,000 core hours over 12 months, and that's to allow you to get on and and um, test jobs and get up to speed and, and try out new things. Further information, I've got the URL of where this online material is, there's documentation, standard help desk, and if you want more training, we have a central training page where you can, um, you can see um, what, what courses are coming up.